Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the KOSAID event on Inspiring a Green Flying Future. My name is Lorenzo Gavilli. I'm the liaison officer to COP26. Before we start this side event, let me pass the floor to Ms. Jane Hube. Jane Hube is a special envoy of the ICAO Secretary General for COP26. And she's also the director in charge of the environmental program in ICAO. She's connected remotely from Montreal. Jane, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lorenzo. Can you confirm you can hear me clearly? Yes. Perfect. So welcome to all of you to this uh, side event uh, from ICAO, Inspiring a Green Flying Future. I thank uh, our fellow panelists to be here with us in such a, a cumbersome day in the negotiations. Thank you so much. Uh, so our intent today is just to share with you what we have been doing for uh, the green transition of international aviation. And um, we are not there in person because unfortunately the dates conflict with our council. And we are in fact taking very, very important decisions in the council for greening the aviation future. So we had to stay in Montreal uh, to attend our council session, but that doesn't mean we cannot be with you and provide this information today. And it's, uh, it's very good that it's Energy Day uh, in, in COP26, and you will see the, how important clean energy and sustainable aviation fuels are for international aviation to um, green the path uh, uh, to our uh, sustainable future. With that, Lorenzo is there. Lorenzo is our liaison officer for COP26, and he will be moderating the session. I'll be here attending uh, from far with some of other, uh, our other officers, and we'll be able to address any questions you have uh, for us. So with no more delays, uh, Lorenzo, please, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jane. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this side event. So I have uh, uh, Ms. Molly Peter Stanley. She's the chairperson of the, technically, uh, tech, uh, of the technical advisory board of the ICAO Council, TAB. Then I have Mr. Dirk Forrester, is the president and CEO of the International Emission Trading Association, AITA. Mr. Alden Dodd, Active Executive Director of the Air Transport Action Group, ATAC. We have also Mr. Alfredo Iglesias, who is the Spanish member of the Council Committee on the Aviation Environmental Protection, CAPE, and Mr. Daniel Ribas, Spanish expert of the CAPE Fuel Task Group. They are also connected remotely and sent us a video message. A very well, warm welcome to all of you. We will start our event today with a short video that we have prepared for you. Uh, the video will highlight ICAO's activities in the field of aviation and climate change since the last ICAO assembly in 2019. It will also provide a summary of the progress by ICAO and its member states in achieving the collective global aspirational goal for international aviation, and also include ICAO ongoing work on the feasibility of a long-term goal, on long-term goal, uh, aspirational goal, ELTAG. So please introduce the video. COVID-19 disrupted aviation activities in an unprecedented manner. 2020 began with numerous states globally shutting down their borders due to the arrival of the coronavirus outbreak. States introduced multiple regulations in an attempt to curb the spread of the virus. Total passengers carried by airlines fell by 60% compared to 2019. Nevertheless, the aviation community has always endeavored to find global solutions through innovation and ingenuity. Today, ICAO, the UN Specialized Agency for International Civil Aviation, is taking a lead in driving a green transition for aviation by fostering an ambitious decarbonization pathway for the sector. The sixth assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made it very clear. We need to act, and we need to act now, to limit global temperature rise to the Paris Agreement target of 1.5 degrees Celsius and avoid the irreversible impacts of global warming. 
every fraction of degree counts, and every sector needs to act. Aviation is no exception. The sector accounts for approximately 2% of the world's man-made CO2 emissions, a share that is unchanged since 1999, despite the growth in traffic. International aviation, which is the mandate of ICAO, is responsible for 1.3%. With the air traffic expected to continue to increase, it is paramount that aviation pursues ambitious goals to further reduce its carbon emissions. Through time, aviation has continued to improve its environmental performance. Aircrafts today are already 70% quieter and 80% more fuel efficient than in the 1960s, demonstrating how aviation has constantly evolved its technology to respond to societal aspirations. But only the introduction of radical, disruptive, and revolutionary innovations will be able to deliver the levels of decarbonization required. Aviation is already shaping its green transition using green technologies in propulsion and energy supply concepts, which are already technologically mature. These initiatives now need massive scaling up and financing. At the same time, the sector is intensively exploring and investing in radical and disruptive concepts on sustainable fuels, electric, hybrid, hydrogen aircraft, and airport infrastructures. ICAO is leading and achieving the collective sectoral goal of 2% annual fuel efficiency improvement and 2020 carbon neutral growth by implementing a basket of CO2 mitigation measures. ICAO developed specific tracker tools to monitor the progress on innovations in each element of the basket of measures. In 2017, ICAO adopted the first ever global CO2 certification standard for aeroplanes. All new aircraft will have to emit lower CO2 emissions. Evolutionary technology will continue to introduce around a 20% improvement in fuel efficiency to each new generation of aircraft. But some of the radical concept, like electric and hydrogen-powered aircraft, could deliver carbon-free operations. The unprecedented pace of developing and deploying of innovative technologies will require the timely deliverable of new global certification frameworks under ICAO. Improvements in daily operations will continue to play a significant role in reducing aviation CO2 emissions. These include optimized routes, enhanced air traffic management, collaborative approaches, and efficient and clean clean ground operations. The biggest challenge in the future is how to reconcile operational performance and infrastructure needs of different technology concepts on the ground and in the air. The contribution of sustainable aviation fuels and clean energy sources will be of paramount importance if international aviation is to reach more ambitious climate goals. The main advantage of drop-in aviation fuel is that they do not require changes to the aircraft or its fueling infrastructure and that they can be mixed with traditional aviation fuels. The technology is proven and more than hundreds of thousands of commercial flights have already taken place, putting sustainable fuels as a perfect measure to be implemented in the short term. Various types of sustainable fuels and production processes have already been approved by the relevant standard-setting bodies in cooperation with ICAO. By the middle of the century, liquid fuels are expected to undergo a fuel transition to sustainable low-carbon sources. Power to liquid fuels made from recycled or directly captured CO2 and low-carbon electricity are just few examples. While priority is and will remain aviation in sector CO2 mitigation measures, ICAO will continue to provide a robust platform for full implementation of the Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, or CORSIA. Significant progress has been achieved by states on the implementation of the CORSIA CO2 monitoring, reporting, and verification MRV procedures, despite the unique challenges associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Aeroplane operators with international flights between those states that have volunteered to participate in CORSIA will start offsetting, following the provisions of Assembly Resolution and Annex 16, Volume 4. Additional states are encouraged to join CORSIA as soon as possible. ICAO is also taking the lead by providing much needed capacity building and assistance to its member states. Thanks to the ICAO Act Corsia program, an impressive number of more than 120 states have voluntarily submitted their state action plans to ICAO. ICAO has been exploring options for a long-term global aspirational goal for international aviation, along with realization roadmaps for consideration by the ICAO Assembly in 2022. 
Hundreds of initiatives, plans, and solutions to reduce aviation in sector emissions have been discussed at the ICAO stock taking events, presenting innovative and disruptive technologies that will shape the future of aviation. ICAO continues to facilitate the development and accelerated implementation of these initiatives, working together with all member states and relevant stakeholders under the ICAO Coalition for Sustainable Aviation. Global connectivity has never been so important. The green transition of aviation is our commitment so that future generations can enjoy the benefits of a sustainable and resilient global air transport. So, I hope you have enjoyed this video. We have just released it. Our first presenter this afternoon is Jane, who will talk about recent developments and future actions by ICAO and its member states in addressing emissions from international aviation. Jane, you have the floor. Good day. My name is Jane Hopi, and I am the director in charge of the environmental program in ICAO. The UN Specialized Agency for International Civil Aviation. It is my pleasure to provide you with an overview of ICAO's work leading the sector to a green flying future. Let me start with a brief introduction of ICAO. ICAO has 193 member states, almost the same constituency of the UNFCCC. ICAO's vision is to achieve the substantial growth of the global civil aviation system. ICAO has five strategic objectives, one of each environmental protection. One of the three overarching ICAO environmental goals is on climate change and is to limit or reduce the impact of aviation GHG emissions on global climate. ICAO member states are fully conscious that with the expected growth of international air traffic following the post-pandemic recovery, it is paramount that international aviation pursues ambitious goals to further reduce its carbon footprint, thus complementing the achievement of the Paris Agreement objectives of limiting global warming to well below 2, preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. The recent six assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, made it very clear that we need to act and we need to act now to limit global temperature rise to avoid the irreversible impacts of global warming. Every part of a degree counts and all need to act now. Aviation is no exception. According to the IPCC, the aviation sector counts for approximately 2% of the world's man-made carbon emissions. International aviation, which is a mandate of ICAO, is responsible for 1.3%. The share of emissions from international aviation, which remains unchanged since 1999, despite the growth of uh, traffic, has been addressed through ICAO and is not covered by the nationally determined contributions, NDCs, under the Paris Agreement. Emissions from international flights are moving from one country to another and happen mostly over international waters. Any state action on these international emissions without proper coordination may unilaterally affect other states. And that's why we do not allocate these emissions to individual states. They are treated as a sector, sector of emissions, and addressed under ICAO. The ICAO Assembly in 2010 established two global aspirational goals for international aviation sector, 2% annual fuel efficiency improvement and a carbon neutral growth from 2020 onwards. To achieve the global aspirational goals and to promote sustainable growth of air to international air transport, ICAO has been pursuing a basket of measures, including aircraft technologies, operational improvements, sustainable aviation fuels, and the global market-based measure, CORSIA. Out of the four measures, the former three measures provide environmental benefits within the aviation sector. Although in-sector emissions reductions measures are preferred, the environmental benefits of these measures are expected not to be sufficient to reach the aspirational goal. Therefore, in 2016, ICAO adopted CORSIA 
as a complementary measure to address the emissions reduction gap and ensure the achievements of the global aspirational goals. Long-term commitments are essential for the construct of uh, decarbonization pathways, but should not shadow the need to act now, while a concrete mechanism is already put in place to achieve the existing CIMAS goals now, ICAO is also working with priority on the feasibility of a long-term global aspirational goal, LTAG, for international aviation. And the results of the work will be presented at the 2022 ICAO Assembly. Let's take a look on the progress being achieved now in light of current goals adopted in 2010. For aircraft technology, in 2017, ICAO adopted the first ever global certification CO2 standards for airplanes. To each new generation of aircraft, ev evolutionary technology will continue to introduce around 20% improvement in fuel efficiency to each new generation of aircraft. But some of the radical concepts like electric and hydrogen powered aircraft could deliver carbon free operations. The unprecedented pace of developing and deploying the innovative technologies will require the timely deliverable of new global certification frameworks under ICAO. This is a priority area for us. Improvements in daily operations will continue to play a significant role in reducing aviation CO2 emissions. This includes optimized routes, enhanced air traffic management, collabor collaborative approaches, and efficient and clean ground operations. The biggest challenge in the future is how to reconcile operational performance and the infrastructure needs of the different technology concepts on the ground and in the air. On sustainable aviation fuels, we have seen tremendous progress. More than 360 thousand commercial flights with drop in aviation fuels have been per, uh, perfect. Nine conversion processes are in place, 43 airports are regularly distributing staff, 20 specific staff policies were adopted or are under development, and close to 20 billion liters of staff are already under off-data agreement. This is an area of a lot of progress, and we'll be talking about that later in this uh, side event. Now, Corsia. Corsia is the first and only global market-based measure for international aviation. 107 states are voluntarily participating in the scheme, and more states are considering. To accommodate the special circumstances and respective capabilities of states, Corsia designs include various features such as phasing implementation with voluntary participation of states in the initial phases of Corsia and the use of sectors average growth factors for the calculation of offset requirements to airlines. Corsia does not impose specific CO2 reduction obligations to specific states, as there is no allocation of international emissions to individual states, as I clarified before. And Corsia offsetting requirements apply to airline operators of participant states. Nevertheless, the reporting of each airline's CO2 emissions are attributed to a single state which collects data and further report the aggregated data to ICAO to avoid duplicative reporting. Course implementation is fully on track, and ICAO completed all necessary steps for the start of the pilot phase this year. ICAO established a robust CO2 monitoring reporting and verification MRV system, which ensures that the collected CO2 data are verified and reported annually by all airline operators through the ICAO Corsia Central Registry. As you know, under Corsia, operators have the choice of complying with their offset requirements, either by buying the Corsia eligible emissions units or 
using core eligible fuels. To ensure that operators reduce robust and verified emissions units for Corsia, ICAO has agreed emissions units criteria and through an independent expert group, the TAB Technical Advisory Body, identifies a set of course eligible emissions units that can be used by operators to meet their CO2 offsetting requirements. In this regard, ICAO will continue to monitor further developments related to Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, in particular, any implications for the implementation of Corsia and its eligible emissions units. To support those operators that prefer the use of Corsia eligible fuels, ICAO has also developed the globally harmonized sustainability criteria, life cycle CO2 values, and certification schemes to incentivize the use of Corsia eligible fuels. Capacity building is the backbone for the full implementation of Corsia by all states. As part of the ICAO's No Country Left Behind initiative, ACT Corsia, Assistance Capacity Building and Training for Corsia program, ensures a coordinated and harmonized approach to bring together all relevant actions and promote coherence to capacity building efforts, also enabling the monitoring of a global progress in a transparent manner. The budget partnership among states are the cornerstone of Act Corsia program. It involves 16 supporting states and 118 requesting states. Through such partnerships, supporting states offer after experts to Corsia to provide training and necessary follow-up with the requesting states in close coordination with the ICAO Secretariat. This chart illustrates the global implementation of Corsia by member states and how relevant data have been collected through the ICAO Corsia Central Registry CCR. For example, you see 117 states that account for 97 of global CO2 emissions from international aviation applicable to Corsia, submitted their 2019 CO2 emissions reports to CCR. Following the request by the 2019 ICAO Assembly to explore the feasibility of a long-term global aspirational goal, uh, LTAG for aviation, ICAO has put in place a solid process to be able to present the results of this work to the 41st session of the ICAO Assembly that is in September 2022. In this LTAC process, data collection on CO2 emissions reductions from green technologies and innovations through the ICAO stock-taking event is a key component for the LTAC process. In order to ensure a transparent and inclusive process for the ongoing LTAC work, ICAO organized a series of regional global aviation dialogues, GLADS, this year, which raised awareness and enabled an open exchange of views among member states. The ICAO Council, Committee on Aviation and Environmental Protection, CAPE, will deliver the results of its LTAC scenarios analysis to the CAPE 12 meeting in February 2022. This outcome of CAPE will then be considered by the ICAO Council, leading up to the 41st session of the Assembly in 2022. Prior to the ICAO Assembly, it will be of fundamental importance to consider all the components of ICAO works on climate change, such as the LTAG, Corsia, and the state action plans in a way to support the aviation green transition. As I mentioned, data collection on CO2 emission reductions from green technologies and innovations is a key component of the LTAG work. In 2020 and 2021, ICAO organized pre stock taking and stock taking events in order to bring together member states, industry leaders, researchers, innovators, and civil society advocates to share information on their ambitious plans, solutions, and policies for decarbonizing international aviation, including measures from technology operations and fuels. The ICAO stock taking process will continue to serve in the future as an important forum and platform to monitor, collect, and collect information, and also to track progress by the aviation sector towards the realization of global aspirational goals. Many net zero plans 
and measures were brought to the attention of the ICAO process, including from our COP26 hosts, the UK. And they are an integral part of the inputs that we are considering for the LTAG work. ICAO has also been working to bring together the ICAO Global Coalition for Sustainable Aviation to make further progress in the development and implementation of CO2 mitigation measures. The coalition includes partners from governments, non-governmental organizations, industry and academia, and its membership is rapidly growing. All stakeholders are welcome to join this ICAO coalition, bringing aviation pioneers together with the aim of facilitating the development of new ideas and accelerating the implementation of innovative solutions for the sector. As you have seen, much progress is being achieved by the sector and we have an unprecedented pace of innovations to build the aviation green transition on solid and effective low carbon technologies and measures. An ambitious outcome at COP26 will further encourage ICAO and its member states to take an ambitious decision for international aviation at the ICAO assembly in September 2022, thus complementing the achievement of the Paris Agreement objectives. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jane. Jane will be available uh, to answer your questions once we have uh, finished with the presentation. Our next speaker is uh, Molly, who will talk about course eligible emission units and the process of uh, ICAO TAP. Molly, you have the floor. Great, thank you so much. And hi everyone, uh, it's, it's very nice to see you all. Um, this is the first negotiating session that I've actually been able to attend one of these. Uh, so, so happy to be here to talk about the work uh, that uh, me and uh, my uh, vice chair, Benedict Chia, who unfortunately was unable to join us today, but since his best, um, as well as the rest of the uh, TAB members have been doing over the last several years. Um, Actually, I've got this thing, let's do that. Um, so before I start uh, describing um, some of the work that we've been doing over the last several years, I, I wanted to introduce myself. Um, I have chaired the technical advisory body since it launched in 2019. Uh, and I also negotiate Article 6 for the US. Um, looking at the, at the screen, uh, you'll see two documents listed there. And I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about them, but uh, the, the presentation, as you'll see, refers to them throughout. So I just wanted to explain for a minute what those are. In the standards and recommended practices for the CORSIA, um, those are the, the standards that, um, that each administering state uh, um, is, enforces domestically. They refer to uh, two documents related to emissions units criteria and to the eligible emissions units themselves. So there's sort of a cross-reference there. Um, and those are the two documents that the technical advisory body uh, works with most closely. Um, and you're, you can find those on the Corsia website. Uh, and I also just wanted to note that the uh, Committee on Aviation Environment Protection um, has uh, various working groups. And one of those working groups is responsible for um, I guess maintaining, making recommendations uh, on the emissions units criteria and the technical advisory body makes the recommendations on uh, the eligible emissions units. As I said, we were established in 2019 by the ICAO Council um, and, and primarily formed to assess emissions unit programs and to make recommendations on the programs that should be um, eligible to supply Corsia eligible emissions units. And when we say programs, as you'll see throughout this presentation, what we're referring to are, are actually what some people call certification standards or mechanisms. Um, so they have a, a series of standards and procedures for certifying activities that reduce emissions and are credited uh, and, and issue emissions reductions as carbon credits. Um, is that there are 19 experts, uh, three from, from each region, um, and you can find information about who we are on, uh, on what we call the TAB website. It's a subset of the Corsia website. 
Um, and all of the documents and decisions, recommendations that I refer to today can also be found there. This is a diagram of the assessment cycle that we go through. It's an annual cycle um, that uh, begins with seeking applications, usually around uh, January of each year. Um, and in those applications, um, every one of the, the questions, and it's a pretty extensive application, um, those questions relate back to the emissions units criteria and what we call guidelines for criteria interpretation that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the tab then takes those applications um, and assesses them through tables that are, that, that sort of are a corollary of every question in the application, which relates to every guideline and every criterion. Um, and that is a process that takes months um, we have a lot of engagement with the programs throughout that process directly through a series of written questions and answers. And um, we also have a public comment process um, that kicks off once we have received those applications. We have a form for members of the public to submit comments back to us and we take those into account when we're uh, uh, scoring programs and asking them questions. Um, we then make recommendations to the uh, ICAO Council that relate to our findings, um, sometimes recommending programs as eligible, sometimes recommending that um, they need to further develop their procedures if they're in early stages, um, or sometimes that they need to be re uh, invited to reapply, um, or to identify that the applicant may not be an admissions unit program. The ICAO Council then takes a decision on those recommendations and then uh, the report that we give to the council that describes all of our findings um, is made public uh, on the website. Um, I've referred to the Corsia Emissions Units Criteria. You'll see the headers for these here and I encourage you um, to look at the document on the Corsia website that contains the, the full text of the criteria. Um, if you go to the TAB website, there's a document that is supplementary materials to our assessment. Um, it's, a, I think, Appendix A to the application form, and that also contains all of the guidelines for criteria interpretation. Um, so those are worth taking a look at. Um, and you'll see here that we distinguish between the criteria that apply to um, the, the ways that, that programs operate, uh, administer their standards, um, govern themselves, um, engage in public participation processes, and, um, and the criteria that govern the, the quality of the emissions units that, that are generated. Um, and that's where you see a lot of those sort of normal environmental integrity um, uh, markers, I guess, that most people are familiar with, but we think that all of these things in combination contribute to the environmental integrity uh, and quality of the programs and the credits. These are the programs that have been recommended uh, and approved by the IKO Council uh, since our first recommendation was made in early 2020. Um, and I, it's important to note, as, as we did at the bottom of the slide, that not all units from these programs are eligible, which I will talk through now. Uh, in the ICAO document um, that refers to the emissions units that are eligible, um, it lists the programs that are eligible. Um, it also identifies their program designated registry that the TAB has recommended sort of is attached to the program and is eligible. Um, the time frame within which the units can be used toward compliance in Corsia, the eligible unit dates, um, which is when eligible units can have been generated, and also the scope of their eligibility. So what is in the scope and also what is outside of the scope. Um, looking at the program designated registry, just wanted to mention that there's also another set of requirements for those registries. Um, that a, an eligible program will attest to um, will attest to the fact that they demonstrate all of those requirements. And that's so that when airlines use that registry, they'll have assurance that they're able to do that and comply with all the requirements for using registries that are in the actual standards themselves. Um, in terms of the eligibility timeframe for all programs right now, they can only be used in the first compliance cycle. 
And uh, for the eligible unit dates, you'll, hear, you'll see here that it was for activities that started their crediting period in 2016. Um, and the eligible units from those activities can have been generated from that time frame through to the end of 2020. Uh, and there are two exceptions that I'll mention in a moment. Um, when you look at that document, as I mentioned, there are a couple of things that have been excluded from eligibility scopes, and these can take a, a variety of forms, um, from a sort of a, a broad identification of everything that is eligible. For example, from this program, all projects that have um, reported on their sustainability co-benefits um, to a, a sort of positive list of methodologies. So it can get very specific. And programs are responsible for identifying those eligible units in their registries with tags that identify them as Corsia eligible. Given where we are um, and, and the context of, of this COP, I just wanted to mention that the guidelines for criteria interpretation uh, for avoiding double counting uh, in the Corsia are, are pretty stringent. These are the headers for some of the topics that they cover, which um, start with the sort of clear uh, guidelines, I think, but have thought through all of the, the possible things that would be needed to avoid double claiming in this context, um, all the way through to um, unit replacement in the case of double counting and compensation mechanisms. Um, so in 2019, in the recommendation that we made in 2020, we found that no programs had these procedures in place, which is why we limited their eligibility time frame uh, to the end of 2020. We have since recommended two programs for eligibility to generate units in this decade um, because they had all of those procedures in place. Um, and, and that is the um, ART Trees Standard and the American Carbon Registry. Um, and in looking at how we assess those programs given the uncertainties in this process, um, and we're hoping in the next uh, couple of weeks to publish um, a, a set of further criteria interpretations that the TAB developed, including to describe its approach to this issue. Um, where we looked at whether the program had comprehensive answers and information and procedures and requirements that, that sort of addressed all of these things um, so that we knew who was going to implement every step of that process, where and how they're evidenced, um, when they are implemented and how they are implemented. And those are actually, in, in the context of double counting, really difficult questions to answer. And so for the programs that did, um, we, were, we felt confident in their eligibility. Uh, finally, uh, and I know I'm a little over time, just to mention that in 2022, we will be reassessing all of the programs that are currently eligible if they're interested in continuing to supply the Corsia uh, in the next uh, compliance cycle or forward. Um, and we'll be focusing on a sample of criteria, in particular, obviously, double counting. Um, also, uh, permanence, additionality, baselines, and sustainable development criteria. For those of you who are following the Article 6 negotiations, that probably sounds like a familiar list. Um, but that's where we've decided to, to focus in particular on those assessments and hope to make a recommendation at the end of next year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Molly, for the interesting presentation. Uh, our next presenter is Dirk, who will provide his perspective on uh, carbon markets. Dirk, you have the floor. Thank you, and it's a, a pleasure to be included on this um, illustrious panel and to talk about a program that, as you might suspect, uh, I think people in carbon markets are quite enthusiastic about it, uh, although the lack of demand at present, for, for obvious reasons, is, is not very exciting. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's been interesting to see the um, I think the markets continued to want to innovate around Corsia, recognizing the changes that, that Molly's talked about, but also to begin refining uh, some of the products that are available on how you might, um, how you might transact, whether that be more of a uh, sort of a bespoke uh, uh, trade, a bilateral trade that is um, uh, perhaps brokered by an intermediary or sometimes it's direct with a, uh, a direct purchase with a 
a project um, developer or through uh, exchange-based products that have, I think, begun to show the way of how they could work with these private standards to develop secondary products that uh, uh, take advantage of some of the flexibility within the registries of those standards to bring veracity to um, uh, like a geo contract, for example, which is one of the contracts that's been developed. Can't look at those right now and say that they're extremely liquid, uh, but again, it's for obvious reasons of, of uh, what's gone on with uh, air travel in the last, um, or, or during the pandemic. But I do think it's paving the way for uh, entities that are um, involved in international aviation that want to get ahead of the curve to do uh, sort of voluntary market transactions that put them a bit ahead of the curve. Uh, I think that's been a really healthy development and it's something that's pretty common to see in um, carbon markets as they grow up is that uh, there are sort of the pioneers that get out and get involved early and help to develop some of the market practices. Um, so we see some of that happening and I think we also see uh, one of the more interesting developments I think has been the growth of interest in voluntary markets in and of themselves and maybe not just aviation uh, industry, but a lot of other industries that are uh, seeing a value. Some of that, I think, is uh, being pressured by um, uh, invest the investment community and, uh, and their own customers to take more action on climate change, and um, international offsets are often one component of that, of that, of those corporate strategies. And Corsia, actually gives an opportunity to buy into a, a sort of a type of product that might have fungibility internationally uh, in, in, um, in, in, compliance market, in the compliance market for aviation. But also I think that model has been begun to be uh, picked up by uh, some developing countries as they develop their own domestic implementation programs. They're recognizing some of the same standards that have been uh, sort of certified for use, if you will, through Corsia. Now, which came first, the chicken or the egg on some of those? Because Corsia, of course, learned from California, which has used that model. Uh, but it is one that I know in, in our interactions with, um, with countries that we think of as maybe being host governments uh, for, for project offsets are now also thinking about their own pricing systems and whether they could build up a, a pricing system that again recognizes international offsets that, um, that are within the bounds of Corsia that gives sort of an added comfort. So I think that's been uh, a really healthy development. Um, this year it looks like we're on track in the, the voluntary sphere to uh, sort of uh, double what was done last year, which I think was double the year before, which takes it up over a, a, a billion dollars in value. Uh, in terms of the primary market trades, and then you'll have other trades that go on around that, and that's that's a, a significant development. But you know, in the in the world of carbon markets, it's not very big because uh, there are markets that, uh, for example, in the European markets or California market, that would be considered a fairly uh, modest amount of capital to generate um, or to attract into the market. Um, so I think that's sort of the state of play from the market side is products are being developed, projects are being developed, but a lot of the demand that I think we expected would have come out of the aviation um, uh, arena, international aviation arena from Corsia is being, um, uh, in a sense, the international side of it is probably more of a voluntary thing right now. Um, it's not going to stay that way permanently permanently, we all hope, right? So we're looking ahead to what we hope to be a much more vibrant future. Um, and hopefully this, uh, the, again, the voluntary demand that's coming in is helping to uh, um, build out the infrastructure that from the market side would be valuable for growth in Corsia going forward. So um, uh, it gives you a little bit of flavor uh, of, of things that are happening out there, and maybe I'll stop there and be happy to engage in the Q&A in a little bit. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, and I have to uh, convey uh, apologies of Molly for leaving, as you might know she's involved in Article 6 negotiations, so she has My, a quite busy schedule. I was going to say I endorse her leaving. <laughs> if she's going to go solve Article 6, I think that's terrific. <laughs> 
Okay, our next speakers are uh, Alfred and Daniel from Spain. They will uh, uh, present Spain views on uh, clean energy for uh, international aviation. We have uh, a video from them that uh, they have just sent to us. Thank you to all the team from ICAO for the opportunity to, opportunity to be here. We appreciate the effort that has, that has been done by ICAO on creating this great side event to showcase innovation solutions that will allow aviation to reduce its emission and complement the achievement of the Paris Agreement objectives. Today, and during this small session, we will make an overview of the importance of the sustainable aviation fuel for the decarbonizing aviation and the role of ICAO and the national authorities to promote the use of SAF. As a Spanish authority from ISA, we have been promoting from a very early stage the development of regional value chains in our territory. We consider that SAF has a great role to decarbonize aviation. SAF is a cleaner substitute for fossil jet fuels. SAF has significant net reduction in emission over conventional kerosene, and if we achieve an increase in the production of SAF, this will allow to reduce the emission of aviation greatly. One of the big advantages of SAF is that no new aircraft design are required. No new engines are required. No new infrastructure in airports are required. And no big logistic change need to be developed. It is a solution that can be implemented now and decarbonization aviation now. These characteristics are particularly interesting for living no country left behind and to have a globally harmonized implementation of the technology. It has been it has to be noted that the cow has been actively and decisively supporting the capacity building and the establishment of partnerships regarding the implementation of sustainable aviation fuel. From Spain, we are aware of how important it is to support states, especially developing countries, and we are always willing to provide technical expertise and transfer know-how in order to trigger regional SAF value chains. The industrialization of SAF is a challenge, but a huge economical, social and industrial opportunity. And all the countries have the opportunity to join and participate in the development of SAF. After all these considerations, it is important to note the enormous work that the member states are performing under the umbrella of ICAO to achieve the development of sustainable aviation fuels worldwide. Note that through ICAO, states were encouraged to support international cooperation on self development and employment by sharing examples of policy implementation, results, lesson learned, which could be useful to all the states. This is, is being done on a daily basis and member states that desire to develop regional value chains can find within ICAO valuable support from countries that already have experience in the field. Corsia, the Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, includes specific methodologies that allow aircraft operators to reduce their offsetting requirements through the use of SAF. This will be very important to incentivize the deployment of SAF. Additionally, the authorities and ECAO are working together in order to develop a long-term aspirational goal for international aviation CO2 emissions, reductions that will allow aviation to reduce its emissions and complement the achievement of the Paris Agreement. Already today, SAF is compatible with the current aircraft and can be blended with kerosene I to 50% using existing engines and the existing fuel supply chain at the airport. They comply strictly with fuel specifications through certification. Aviation will be dependent on dropping fuels for the following decades and this is said by the industry. Therefore, an important work is being performed between engine companies and authorities to be able to fly soon 
with 100% certified staff. In our view, we also see a huge potential to the waste fuel based on municipal solid waste and that is eligible under Corsia. They provide a solution to the growing problem of landfill saturation in densely populated urban areas. We are, for instance, developing one project in the Madrid area and we see that this technology has a huge potential, especially for developing countries that also suffer from landfill saturation. Aviation could help to mitigate that problem. We are open in that sense to cooperate internationally with other countries that identify the same potential for municipal solid waste as a feedstock and its social economic benefits. Finally, and regarding Spain, AESA has been working for a long time on the soft topics, starting with the signature of a public private platform called Center of Excellence for Sustainability in Aviation, that brought for the very first time in Spain feedstock producers, fuel producers, airlines, academia, and sustainable experts, together with the public administration. This work has allowed the promotion of several industrial projects that will allow to produce SAF at a national level. As conclusion, SAF has a huge potential and the great advantage of using current technology and its infrastructure. The challenge is to bring the price gap down so it can become the new fuel standard for aviation. Spain and AESA have been working for a long time on SAF topics. We are very committed to the energy trans transition and the carbonization of aviation. We are aware of the importance of international cooperation. We need to make SAF truly global, and for that we need to be and provide assistance activity on SAF to requesting a state and collaborate within the ICAO framework. Finally, I can express that the SAF is now here, it's a big opportunity and all the country can join in fighting against the climate change effect. Thank you very much. Recording stopped. And I would like to thank uh, Alfredo and Daniel for sending this video. So next in our program is Aldain who will present industry perspectives, including on sustainable aviation fuels. Aldein, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all of you uh, for joining us this evening as well. Uh, and thank you to ICAO for, for hosting this session. Um, I think one of the problems with being last is that many of the things that you wanted to say have already been said by uh, others. So I'll flick through uh, a, a quick presentation uh, very quickly. Um, it's it's nice to have uh, been introduced uh, to the SAF topic already um, uh, because I think it is energy day uh, today uh, at COP um, and actually uh, energy is one of the key parts of our decarbonisation uh, pathway uh, as an industry uh, as well. Um, so a few weeks ago, my organisation, uh, the Air Transport Action Group, which brings together all the different parts of the aviation uh, sector, uh, declared that we were going to shift our long-term climate goal to net zero 2050 uh, as an industry. I think one of the first uh, industries in the world to have this commitment uh, at a global level uh, across all parts of the sector. Uh, so it includes through uh, IATA, uh, the global uh, airlines, uh, through ACI, the global airports, uh, through CANZO, all the air traffic control uh, organizations uh, of the world, um, and then uh, the manufacturers of aircraft uh, and engines. So a, a whole of industry uh, effort. Uh, and of course, uh, for us, uh, aviation is uh, global aviation. It's not just international, not just domestic, it's uh, all uh, traffic. Um, and of course, this is part of our commitment uh, to uh, try and meet that stretch goal of the Paris Agreement uh, for, for 1.5 uh, degrees couple of important elements uh, as part of that. Uh, one of them, uh, I think, uh, key, uh, and that's a transition away from fossil fuels by mid-century um, as part of a wider uh, aviation energy shift, uh, which could include things like electric uh, and hydrogen as well, and I'll get onto that in a minute. Um, but as we've heard, actually one of the biggest uh, uh, opportunities and challenges uh, is shifting to sustainable aviation uh, fuel. Um, but it also includes other elements as well, uh, not just about new technology of aircraft uh, and an energy shift, 
Uh, it also includes improvements in operations and infrastructure. Uh, I'm not going to go into that uh, in detail, but actually they provide some very real examples of early action that we can take today uh, to reduce emissions even uh, now. Um, and then uh, in the near term, as we've heard from, from Molly and Dirk uh, and Jane as well, uh, Corsia uh, is a real option uh, for reducing emissions today through high quality uh, offsets. And you can uh, see the rigor with which uh, the Corsia program is being put together uh, as well. Um, but then uh, as we transition uh, into the 2040s, 2050s, that's going to transition into uh, carbon removal opportunities. So I'm not going to go into that in great detail, but, um, but it is an important part of the, uh, the strategy. So in shifting to um, the, the goal uh, of net zero uh, 2050, um, we had to have a look uh, where we've come from uh, and where we're going to. Uh, and as an industry, we have uh, been quite successful in reducing our CO2 emissions uh, on a per passenger uh, basis, per passenger kilometer basis, uh, to around half of where they were uh, in 1990, um, today's uh, flights. Um, and so you can see that uh, we've already managed to avoid uh, tracking on the red pathway that you can see going up there. Um, and based on current trends of traffic growth, uh, we expect that uh, we would potentially produce, uh, with today's technology aircraft, around two gigatons of CO2 uh, by 2050, if we were not to improve uh, beyond where we are today. Uh, but of course, the goal is to get to net zero. Um, so the big question is, how do we go from where we are today uh, to uh, that net zero goal. And so we're doing it through technology, through operations, through new types of fuel, um, and through uh, potential for market-based measures. So to help answer the question of how we get from, uh, from uh, those two points uh, down to net zero, um, we did some analysis, which we've called the Waypoint uh, 2050 uh, report. Uh, there's a, sh a copy of the summary here, uh, and I've got some copies here, but uh, also available uh, online as well. Um, and it really uh, tried to answer the question, which levers do we need to pull in as which quantities uh, in order to get down to that net zero uh, goal? So uh, as you can imagine, when you look at uh, traffic forecasts, when you look at uh, technology and operations and infrastructure and fuels, uh, you can get to many hundreds of different scenarios uh, to get to that goal. We've chosen three illustrative scenarios. Uh, the middle one there looks at meeting the goal mainly through uh, new uh, types of energy through sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, the third one looks at the potential uh, if we were to able uh, were able to push the lever around new technology like hydrogen uh, and electric as hard as we can. Um, and then scenario one is kind of halfway uh, in between. And what we wanted to do here was to give an idea of how much sustainable aviation fuel we would need if we were to go down one of those routes. Um, and if we were not able to pursue uh, new technologies like hydrogen, uh, how can we make up the difference through sustainable aviation fuels? So just to give you a, a very quick uh, overview of where new uh, technologies in SAF could be deployed. Um, and this is something that's changing all the time. Technology is, is shifting uh, quite fast, particularly at the moment. There's a lot of work being done uh, on electricity and hydrogen as potential drivers uh, of aircraft. But what we can imagine right now is that we will uh, potentially get uh, electric, uh, and that can be uh, either battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell electric aircraft in the smaller uh, size category, so between 9 and 19 seats, potentially around about uh, 2025 to 2030 period, um, that we might see uh, a use for hydrogen uh, a few years after that, uh, sort of 2030 to 2035, uh, in the slightly larger categories. But the important point here is that uh, for medium and long-haul aircraft, which produce around about three quarters of global aviation CO2 emissions, uh, that we will still need sustainable aviation fuel for those well out to the middle of the century uh, and probably beyond uh, as well. So that's a key driver for us to really push sustainable aviation fuel. So where are we today? Current state of deployment, um, as you heard from Jane, we've flown around about 365,000 uh, flights on a blend of sustainable aviation fuel since it was first certified for use in commercial aircraft in 2011. Um, it's around about less than 1% of current uh, fuel use, so obviously very small quantities today. Um, but 
uh, this is a picture that's changing pretty rapidly. So there's now about 14 billion liters of SAF in publicly announced uh, offtake agreements uh, from airlines so far. Um, and if we look at where we're going to be uh, over the next few years leading up to 2030, um, you can see a, a whole range of new uh, production facilities coming on stream in the next couple of years alone, which is really going to boost production uh, and boost the use of uh, sustainable aviation fuel as well. We know that there are probably 30 uh, production facilities from 2025 until 2030 that uh, have not publicly been announced yet, but are in the final stages of uh, planning uh, and financing. Of course, you can't build these things overnight. It takes a while to finance uh, and, and build uh, these types of facilities. But we can imagine that by 2030, based on our current expected trajectory of production uh, and also uh, the commitments that have been made by airlines, uh, particularly some very large commitments made by uh, big carriers um, and uh, legislation uh, or uh, rules that are coming in in Europe uh, and particularly the US as well uh, with the, uh, the White House uh, uh, announcement a few months ago, that we can expect to see around about 6.5% of our total fuel use in 2030 being uh, sustainable aviation fuel. But that's what we know today, uh, and of course these things uh, can shift, and they need to as well. So if we take um, what we expect to see at the moment, which is uh, shown on this chart as the F1 high plus uh, uh, forecast uh, in 2030, uh, as I said, it's about 6.5%. Um, if we are to get to the uh, requirements needed to meet our net zero goal uh, through the different scenarios that we've uh, outlined, which are the F3, F2, or F4 um, pathways that you see there. Um, we're going to need to uh, approximately double that in a few years after um, 2030. Um, so, uh, of course, the trajectory uh, is going to be steep after 2030, um, but uh, it is eminently uh, achievable. So one of the things I did want to mention, uh, and it's something that's at top of mind for uh, the aviation sector as we shift into this uh, process <coughs> is uh, the importance of sustainability. Um, so you saw the level of uh, rigor that's being placed on sustainability within the Corsia uh, process. We're thinking the same way about uh, aviation fuels as well. Um, there's no point in us doing this if these fuels are not sustainable. And we want to avoid some of the issues uh, that we saw, particularly around road transport uh, in Europe. Uh, when uh, it was pushed too fast, too far, and uh, sustainability criteria weren't there. So the analysis that we've done uh, takes a very uh, conservative approach on sustainability, um, and also a very conservative approach uh, on the availability of different feedstocks to aviation. Obviously, there are opportunities to use uh, some of these feedstocks in other sectors as well, um, and so we've taken what we consider a fair share um, of that approach. Uh, we're not expecting to be able to get 100% uh, of different feedstocks for use uh, in air transport. So what are the kind of feedstocks? Well, we've heard already um, from, uh, from our colleagues in Spain uh, about a few of them. Uh, today, most of the feedstocks are waste oils, um, but that's going to be shifting uh, as we start developing new uh, production processes um, and they come on stream. We're going to start seeing municipal solid waste being used uh, in the next few years um, and then shifting towards advanced uh, uh, alcohol to jet uh, type processes. There are some options for uh, rotational and cover crop uh, use, but fairly uh, limited. Um, and then I think uh, towards the middle of the century, power to liquid uh, looks like it's going to be uh, the biggest opportunity uh, that we uh, might see. But of course, these things play out differently in different parts of the world. And so um, we can expect to see this shift over time from what we uh, use mainly today, which is a heifer-based process, uh, through uh, more advanced feedstocks, and then uh, the power to liquid opportunities start becoming bigger um, as the cost uh, comes down. But of course, the transition in uh, energy for aviation or other sectors also creates opportunities. Um, and just to highlight a couple of things there, and I think we've heard from, uh, from our colleagues in Spain as well about the opportunities that might exist in different parts of the world. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that struck me in the analysis that was done uh, by a consultancy for us is that 90% of current oil production comes from just 22 countries. Um, and with the uh, diversification of sources of fuel 
um, that could spread uh, across the world and create energy opportunities, green energy opportunities uh, across uh, the, the different parts of the world that, that are not sort of seeing that today. Um, it's going to cost, for sure, um, and depending on the pathway, up to 1.45 trillion over 30 years. But actually, when you annualize that, it's around about 6% of current uh, capex for oil and gas. Uh, so it's not out of the realm of possibility, and that's around about the amount of fuel that we use uh, in, in the global fuel mix uh, today anyway for aviation. Um, and, and importantly, I think it's going to sustain or create jobs, um, potentially up to 14 million uh, jobs. Um, and uh, this can also play a part in helping with the transition between fossil fuel uh, and, uh, and sustainable uh, fuels uh, as well. I'm just going to skip the next slide in the uh, interest of time um, and talk a little bit about costs. Obviously, cost uh, is incredibly important for uh, airlines in particular, very low margin business uh, at the best of times. And this is certainly not the best of times uh, right now, uh, although hopefully will improve. Um, but we expect the cost of sustainable aviation fuels across a range of different uh, feedstock sources and pathways to come down over time. Uh, this chart shows when you add in the cost of carbon that it starts becoming uh, into the realm of what we've, ex what we've seen and experienced in aviation uh, over the last 20 years in terms of uh, the cost of our current uh, traditional fuel. Um, so these things will come down, but we also need government policy uh, to help uh, drive that. So I've got the, the link here to the reports uh, if you want to look in much greater detail uh, than I've been able to provide you, and also the uh, declaration, the commitment from the industry as well. I'll just leave you with uh, the, the thought that um, I'm personally more confident than ever that we can actually achieve this. The, the number of uh, announcements that have been made, the number of new commitments that have been made over the last six to 12 months alone within the sector, despite the fact that this has been the worst time in aviation history leaves me with a lot of confidence that we can actually get there. There's a lot of work to do, for sure. Um, and we're going to need help from governments uh, through uh, good policy. We're going to need help from the energy industry to help us with this uh, as well. Um, and I'd also encourage uh, governments uh, to agree uh, a new long-term goal for aviation uh, at the ICAO assembly next year. Uh, we certainly will stand behind that as industry. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aldane. And uh, this concludes uh, uh, our presentation session. Uh, but before I open the floor for question, I would like to, to ask two question, a question to the panelists. Uh, so if in a nutshell, uh, you could say what uh, your, are your expectation for COP26 and uh, how a positive out outcome uh, would uh, help the work of ICAO. Mm. <laughs> so, um, I think in the, in the sphere related to, to th this topic, um, obviously the Article 6 discussions are, are critical to uh, providing frameworks for uh, cooperation. And as I was listening to Haldane, I was thinking every industry in the world is doing a similar process. Uh, maybe not with the rigor, because maybe they haven't been under the spotlight quite as much, but industries are starting to do that. And as they think about what net zero means for them, the net matters a lot because it is going to ultimately mean massive tran transition inside their industries, but it also means they got to cooperate with others. So the fuels industry is going to be very important to the success of the aviation industry. And, um, and I think Article 6 provides sort of this, uh, this base of operation that can unleash a lot of investment to help deliver uh, these uh, net zero goals that so many um, corporates are putting together. And frankly, it's there to service the countries that are trying to achieve greater and greater ambitions. So keep your eye on Article 6. Uh, it's, uh, for, for Article 6 negotiations, we're like midstream, right? It's, uh, it's really going to go down to the wire next, uh, ne at the end of next week, I suspect. Um, but uh, I think that breakthrough along with the set of things that countries are already talking about is, uh, is also uh, like that'll be a part of a package of things that come together dealing with finance and transparency. And that's what I'm expecting and uh, just waiting to see the, uh, the fluidity in the negotiations pick up. What about you, Hal? <laughs> <laughs> so 
uh, obviously, our COP26 is, is at ICAO next year, at the ICAO Assembly, um, and it's an interesting parallel to the Paris Agreement. We got the Paris Agreement, and a year later we got uh, the agreement uh, on Corsia um, at, uh, at ICAO. So hopefully we can uh, also see that this time, uh, that we have uh, an ambitious COP, which has achieved uh, a number of different things, and we're seeing actually some pretty significant announcements coming out here. Hopefully that provides the momentum that we need to get a long-term uh, goal uh, at ICAO next year among states. So that's that's what I want to see out. It's a, it's a real sort of focus on ambition. Yes, and can we get the answers from Jane? If we can put her on screen. Thank you, thank you, Lorenz. I think from us in ICAO, the expectation uh, from COP is most and foremost uh, more ambition from states. I think if we all have this uh, collective responsibility and put our ambition really, really high, and that we understand that uh, every you know fraction of uh, degree counts and all have to act, uh, aviation included, we, uh, we will have very good discussions next year in ICAO and we, we can then achieve uh, also a very ambition, uh, ambitious uh, outcome here in ICAO for aviation. That said, there are, of course, a lot of components uh, for that ambition uh, to be realized. I think um, two main uh, components is that we have a stable uh, sign for the carbon market in terms of the, the price of carbon and the future of uh, Corsia uh, as a player in that uh, market. I think it's important also in terms of energy you know, um, how they uh, said, I said, uh, I think everybody has said, Alfredo mentioned it clearly, you know, um, we are uh, uh, an energy thirst, let's say, uh, sector. So we, we consume a lot of energy. We need a lot of energy intensity uh, to fly. So uh, we, we always have to understand that aviation is uh, different than road transport, you know, to, to move something on, on the ground is one thing. To take off from the ground is a, a different push that you need, it's a different amount of energy altogether that, that you require. Uh, so we, we need a lot of energy. And uh, so um, all the measures on, on related to clean energy that would enable more access uh, uh, for uh, clean energy to come to aviation in a, a level playing field is, is very important. So all those discussions on energy, the share of energy, the policies to incentivize, uh, incentivize clean energy, we, we need um, international aviation to be a, a very active participant in that discussion. Um, I think that technology transfer uh, and financing discussions are also key outcome of that meeting. You know, we have this no country left behind uh, policy and we, we will have to pursue um, alternatives that will enable all countries to be uh, very uh, um, true, truly uh, players in, in constructing that future. So you have seen in our presentation how much emphasis we put on capacity building, uh, that is key. We, we, in, in international aviation, we need harmonization. We need all the players to be in the same level of acting, uh, be it for safety, security, or environment. We, we need this harmonization of measures. And for that, we need to be able to bring all the players to the, the, the same level of uh, implementation. And that's why I think um, we want to see very good results in, in COP, in, in all those fields that I mentioned, because that will enable us as a sector also contributing to the, to the achievement of the goals. You will have all the NDCs that will be delete, uh, dealing with the national emissions. Then you have ICAO, IMO, and the Montreal Protocol with maritime aviation and the gases that are not in the, uh, under the, the, the UNFCCC also playing a, a, a complementary role, all of us together, then will be uh, what we need for the achievement of uh, the goals. So uh, those are our expectations uh, for this week, next week. And I think we are in a good uh, track. 
So I'm also happy that Molly left very, very early to, to be fully engaged in the, in, the, in the discussions because this is very central for us. Thank you, Jane. If the technician allow uh, to have five minutes more, we can take a question from the floor. Yeah. Please present yourself, and I think you have to ask the question on the microphone there. Robert Whitfield from Greener by Design. Uh, we heard uh, a, a very encouraging uh, suggestions about uh, sustainable aviation fuels to address the CO2 challenges for aviation. That is encouraging. What was extraordinary, however, was that you know all, you all know very well that the non-CO2 element of aviation's impact is twice as big as the CO2 impact. Neither the video, nor Jane's presentation, nor the industry presentation made the slightest reference to non-CO2. When is this going to change? So if, if you can put uh, Jane on, uh, I, I imagine is a question for Jane. If she is hearing, she can answer. Otherwise, I, I, I can provide you with the ICAO view in terms of science. So ICAO is fully aligned with the science and uh, is going to change when the IPCC is coming out with its uh, assessment. Uh, at the moment, there's no scientific consensus on non-CO2 effects. So we are just waiting for the IPCC to do the study. We are working with the IPCC in this direction and uh, uh, we, we are ready to provide our contribution. I don't know if panelists want to add. Yeah, I'm just conscious of time here, but um, I think it's a very important question for sure. Uh, something that we are also looking at, um, it is part of the process, and of course a lot of industry uh, organizations are taking part in scientific uh, work to figure out exactly how uh, the, uh, the, the non-CO2 effects can also be avoided uh, as much as possible. It's quite encouraging to see actually that a lot of the work around sustainable aviation fuel also reduces things like contrails uh, as well. Um, and there's trials going on already uh, about contrail avoidance um, to see if we need to do that, uh, then we're ready to actually uh, uh, implement those kind of things once uh, the scientific understanding is, is better uh, understood. We're, we have, we're being flashed very uh, intently <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, the presentation will be all available on, uh, online on the ICAO website, uh, together with the links to the events and all the material. Thank you very much, and uh, an applause for our panelists. Mm -hmm.